Welcome to plenary session number one. Uh, sorry for the uh, delay, but these things uh, happen, and I think we're well prepared, and we're going to go till 1.15. So this panel, um, uh, this session is entitled Understanding the Asian and Asian-Canadian Experience in Higher e Education. I am Takashi Fujitani. I teach in the History Department and at the Asian Institute at the University of Toronto, and I'm also the director of the Dr. David Chu program in Asia Pacific Studies. So it's a great honor for me uh, to serve as moderator today. And I'd like to thank the primary organizer, organizers of the forum, uh, Gabe Trufo, uh, Joselle Angelica Gerardo, as well as uh, Dean Sugiman, uh, and of course, all the panelists for coming together to discuss the topic of anti-racism uh, with a particular focus on anti-Asian racism in higher education. Uh, before proceeding, I'd like to acknowledge that the soon to be renamed Ryerson University and the University of Toronto, where I work, are built upon the traditional lands of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Huron, and many Indigenous peoples. Uh, today, this area remains home uh, to many Indigenous peoples from across the continent, and we are grateful for them for the opportunity to gather to uh, live here, uh, to uh, live in friendship, uh, to work and educate uh, one another. While the National Forum today highlights anti-Asian racism, we will not forget that we are also settler colonials ourselves, and that we must hold ourselves responsible and accountable. In addition, we hope that this will be an opportunity to think through, but also outside the category of Asians and to build solidarities with indigenous peoples, black and other racialized groups. Uh, the charge for us today is to discuss from our own experiences and observations as faculty, students, and community representatives how anti-Asianism manifests in uh, higher education and, if possible, suggest some ways to contest this racism. And to discuss the topic, we have a fantastic group of panelists who I've just gotten to know a bit while we're waiting. Um, and let me just briefly introduce them and then move on to the uh, discussion. Um, and I'm going to go in the order of um, uh, the, the names on the, on the schedule. So first we have um, Manel Matani, who has served as senior advisor to the Provost on Racialized Faculty at UBC, where she is the Brenda and David McLean Chair of Canadian Studies. She's also an associate professor at the Institute of Social Justice and an, an award-winning uh, journalist, broadcaster, and former chair of Metropolis, Ontario. Her uh, memoir, May It Have a Happy Ending, is forthcoming from Doubleday uh, Penguin Random House. Um, uh, next, uh, Dan Kanteler um, has worked in higher education, um, student affairs for more than a decade uh, in learning uh, support and uh, advising roles. Uh, currently, uh, he, as the decision support analyst, he's, he supports the accreditation team at the Ted Rogers School of Management. Management. He also serves as co-chair uh, for Positive Space Faculty and Staff Network, Director of Inclusion and Anti-Oppression for uh, Forte uh, Toronto Gay Men's Course and Director at Large for CACUSS. Um, uh, next we have uh, Rabia Lombard, uh, who is a Human Rights um, Studies candidate at Columbia University. Her current research focuses on incorporating women of color in the education curriculum. She's a recent graduate of um, X University, um, where she was honored with numerous scholarships and awards for achieving uh, academic excellence while at demonstrating a commitment to student government and leadership. Um, and last but not least at all is uh, Amy Goh, uh, who is the president of the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice. Um, uh, the, the council educates, engages, and advocates for social justice and equity for all in Canada and has been at the forefront of the movement to combat rising anti-Asianism since uh, the beginning of 2020. Uh, Amy is a social worker by training and has dedicated her professional career to serving immigrants, seniors, um, and as well as promoting and advocating for culturally and linguistically appropriate care and health equity for racialized 
communities. Um, so I'd like to start um, by asking each of the panelists to tell us a bit about your work uh, and or your course of study and briefly mention what kinds of issues that you feel need to be addressed in higher education. And I'd also like to invite the audience to use the chat function to ask questions, although I have to warn you that we, we may run short at the end uh, and uh, so we may not get to very many of them. But hopefully we'll be able to take a few toward the end of the session. So um, with that, I'd like to begin the conversation and ask um, Manel, first of all, if you could tell us something about your work and briefly mention what kinds of issues you feel need to be addressed in I higher education. I hope you can education. hear me. It feels like my internet is dropping out. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's great. Let's see if this will work. I'm hoping it'll come through. Let me know if it doesn't work. Can you still hear me? Yeah? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Tech. That was really helpful, I think, as an introduction. Um, I want to speak very quickly because I want to make sure there's enough time for my fellow panelists, but I want to speak about my former role as senior advisor to the provost. Oops. Oh. Oh. Freezing up, Manel. Okay. We're going to have to see what happens here. I'm doing everything I can. Okay. It's hard sometimes. How's that? Can yeah, you still okay hear me? Now. Okay, yeah, let's okay see. This... Okay, let's see. So this is the first role of its kind created at a Canadian university, and I felt very fortunate to be an inaugural recipient. Formerly, their experience in the East. Yeah, all good. What I heard did not surprise me, and unfortunately, uh, you're you're breaking up quite a lot. Asian racism, namely that in the eyes of a white supremacist academic institution. Often all Asians are seen as interchangeable. All good. The predominant sentiment goes, we all, all we need is one Asian in every department to fulfill our obligations to create an anti-racist space for progressive pedagogy and practice. A lot of you will have seen the New York Times piece this year about the concept of the interchangeable Asian that at some top, top, some top companies, Asian Americans are overrepresented in mid-level roles and underrepresented in leadership. And this kind of root of this workplace inequality could stem from the all too common experience of being confused for someone else. Yet scholars of sociology, psychology, and Asian American history have said there's something serious and damaging behind this phenomenon of an Asian-based blindness. I see this often at the university. A lot of people say, well, why would we hire another Asian person? We already have the one, the token one. This is something that I hope we can discuss in more detail because it takes a lot of time and energy for me to convince heads of departments that at best their unconscious bias, but at worst their pervasive racism refuses the acknowledgement of the complex differences between Asian faculty. We are not interchangeable. The last point that I really hope I'll have time to speak about in more detail is that we need to create constellations of care. The only way we can make change is if we focus on coalitional solidarities. I look forward to speaking about that more in the panel today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. And um, next, um, I would like to invite uh, Dan uh, to speak on this issue. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again. It's wonderful to be part of this first plenary panel. Um, I think some of the issues from my experience working in student affairs and student support over the past you know, 10 or so years and also recently finishing my own master's of education is sort of seeing how, um, how Asian and Asian Canadian students um, experience and navigate the institution. So from first year, um, possibly juggling multiple responsibilities uh, with family and work. Um, and although they may be largely represented in institutions by number, oftentimes may be feeling um, still like out, still being regarded and treated like outsiders. Um, and that is for both, um, you know, domestic or international, although, you know, how we define that, you know, is maybe a little bit uh, not as clear sometimes, um, but regardless of of, um, of where you were born or your heritage, um, sometimes uh, you can still experience microaggressions or misunderstandings um, or assumptions about your culture. Um, and that also is very much uh, representative of um, of the place that you are. So uh, this, this there can be regional differences, um, you know, whether you're in the city or in a smaller town, uh, things along those natures. And I think what I'm really interested in discussing um, in the panel today is the concept of the model minority and how the how those dynamics play out. Um, and it's just to hear from 
the, the opinions and, and experiences of my fellow panelists. So I'll throw it back to you, Tak. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Rabia? Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Rabia and my pronouns are she and her and I'm the student representative on this panel. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, and I am a recent graduate of X University. I graduated with a bachelor's in history with a minor in criminology. And I'm currently studying at Columbia University, studying human rights. And I am so excited to hear all the conversations that we'll have today. Uh, particularly what I'm interested in is what has already been slightly touched on is the tokenism of Asian um, Canadians in the employment industry as well, and hiring more diverse, uh, more diversely, not just to fill a quota, but just because that is what should be done to focus more on merit and more on what the accomplishments are rather than filling um, a diversity quota. And also the discrimination that Asian Canadians face in the employment industry as it pertains to um, name-based discrimination as well as gender discrimination. Um, that's currently what I'm focusing my thesis on at Columbia. So I'm super excited about all the conversations that we'll be hearing. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Amy, we ask you to speak. Hi. Thank you so much. My, um, and I'm Amy Go, president of CCNCSJ. My pronoun is he, she, and her. And I'm truly grateful to the many First Nations that allow me to work and live in their traditional territories in Toronto. Thank you to the organizers for engaging CCNCSJ in this continuing important dialogue on anti-Asian racism. And while we were very frustrated to see the rising anti-Asian racist hate in the last 18 months, we are also very heartened to be part of a solidarity and community resistance movement that has resolved to combat racism. And many of our allies are from the higher education. And I've been privileged to call to have worked with many of the friends in higher, in, uh, higher education institutions like X University and others that are committed to work in partnership and in solidarity with community advocacy groups like ours. That means that they are willing to share the power and access to resources and decision-making that a community, community groups may not have. And I think it is important to continue this dialogue of how higher education can be true partner and ally by building that trusting relationship with community groups and by truly sharing that power and so that we can leverage all of our resources to build a stronger anti-Asian, anti-racism movement period. So I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for uh, getting us jump started in this conversation. I, I hear a lot of topics that we can uh, take up, but I think maybe there was a common, common idea of uh, the tokenism in uh, the university and the inability of the institution to recognize individual difference. I can speak from my own experience as well uh, about that. Um, and I, I, I used to be often mistaken for um, a colleague of mine who is South Asian and, uh, and really very, look very different from me, but, uh, but, um, and much more handsome than me. But anyway, we were, we were you know, we, we were all part of the same person or in hiring an Asian woman, you know, they, they understood that or they felt that Asian women were all the same thing, you know, and they would talk about someone who um, had been hired long ago or this person is just like such and such. But at any rate, um, if we want to talk more about this tokenism as well as the issue of the model minority that uh, Dan and others have raised. So if uh, anybody wants to take a crack at those issues, tokenism and model minority discourse. And just raise your hand if you want to begin. Sure, I think I'll, I'll jump in and start. So I think like the, yeah. the issue or concern about, you know, tokenism, you know, are um, Asian folks or Asian bodies who are in the room, are they just there as decoration, right? Or as a flair, if you will, to show or demonstrate visibly that we're inclusive. Um, there is such diversity um, within um, Asian experience um, and cultures and languages, like thinking about how large the, the continent is, the countries, what do people consider when um, 
when they say uh, someone is Asian um, or from an Asian background. Um, right. And I, so I think that that's something to consider and it, it's, it's insulting, frankly, um, right. To kind of wash uh, over with a broad, um, you know, uh, broad uh, stroke uh, of a brush, right. To kind of encompass all those folks. Um, and there are lots of issues. I think even when you talk about building solidarities, it's sort of within uh, Asian communities as well um, in terms of different cultural groups or identities, um, you know, which uh, you think about intersectionality, um, even thinking about the recent experience of there being an Asian faculty and staff um, kind of network that's formed at X University. Um, how do we make that representative for, um, are we also then um, missing um, uh, hearing uh, experiences from folks who aren't showing up for whatever reason or who have um, under others who have more of a voice. So uh, I'll start with that. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else want to speak on that? I mean, we can also talk about this issue of um, who counts as Asian or who counts as Asian Canadian, the heterogeneity that you're talking about. Um, you know, one aspect, I think, of the model minority discourse that you're referring to is the kind of lumping together of all the Asian uh, people when, as you say, there's a great deal of, of diversity. So um, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not I wonder if someone else also wants to address this issue, model minority. Yeah, Amy? Uh, Manel, you want to go first? No, please, Amy, I want to hear you first, then I'll go. Okay. Okay. So actually, I want to use my because I think model minority is is a myth or a bias that actually that we also have have um, have um, have been incorporating in our own psyche, right? So Asian Canadians and and that's why when I I actually went to Waterloo and I was in psychology, I was the only two Chinese in my class decades ago, and then my uh, nephew. Um, also graduated by uh, from Waterloo, but in accounting years, decades later. And when I went to his convocation and I saw mostly Asian and white students, and in fact, my nephew really wanted to be an artist. He really wanted to be an artist, but because two reasons, one is that, oh, it would be too hard to make a living as an artist. And second of all, it's really the expectations of the parents, right? The parents that expected all of these Asian, young Asian kids to be in a profession that is more based on science or, you know, that are that are not as subjective to personal interpretations such as art and culture. So you are less likely to be screened out just because your art or your work is not appreciated by the white dominant communities, right? So, and because of that, right, I want I would challenge the higher institutions too in terms of when you look at how do you then um, of course, admit, right? And also recruit faculty members. Are they mostly found in the quote unquote engineering, computer science and all that? You know, are they also mm -hmm. in social work? Are they also in English or in French or film or creative art? You know, all that. Because these, the voices that are missing also are those that are particularly impacted, you know, in the areas that the Asian Canadians are not represented. And so I think it's important for us to, all of us to consider how it impacted on our own life, but also call out to institutions to look, to really systemically look at where, and, and based on data, right, based on lived experiences of everybody, all the stakeholder in the higher institutions and how this model minority myth has impacted all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Manel? Yes, Manel? Yeah, I love everything. Yep, can you hear me? It's all good? Yep. yep. Okay, good. Yep, good. Um, I loved everything that Amy just said, and I think that's really, really important. And I do think it's our responsibility in the ac in academic circles to really think about some of the things that Amy's just raised. I mean, one of the things that I often think about is who gets to actually identify as Asian Canadian, right? This idea of thinking about how we can actually begin mm -hmm. to understand these kinds of commitments that we're making to make change. So one of the things that's been on my mind is, you know, are there limits to our thinking around this category? And it's a very sticky question, I think, for particularly people 
people who identify as South Asian, like me, who's South Asian and Iranian. And I'm wondering if we need to ask different questions. I'm working on a project right now that asks, says, basically says that if we want a whole new world of answers, we need a whole new world of questions. But how do we address this one particular colonial question? I've been reading the work of Zhao Bei Chen recently. She's a scholar at Carleton, and she says something that's very powerful, I think. She says anti-Asian racism needs to be understood as a white settler colonial cultural tradition that acquires new contents in times of crises. And if there's anything that we can say, we are certainly going through one of those crises right now. It's, I'd argue it's through this construction that the category of Asian Canadian can hold certain forms of complicit currency. And it's something that I think we really have to challenge, this idea that Asians are seen as uncouth, ostentatious, or sinister. I saw that firsthand at the CBC when I witnessed scripts that included statements like the Chinese love to gamble. The reality is, is that we need to challenge these kinds of very pervasive stereotypes in all the different arenas that we work with, whether we're in the NGO or whether we're working at the universities, and think about the possibility of considering solidarities outside of the national formation. Tack already generously said, I'm the Brendan David McLean Chair in Canadian Studies. I'm the first woman of color to hold this position after Tina Liu. So I feel a great deal of responsibility to think through what an anti-Canada Canadian Studies would look like. So outside the national formation, given that I still find it difficult to identify as Canadian, even in the country in which I was born and raised. So I'm very curious about how do we identify and think about a critical Canadian studies, drawing from the work of people like Carrie Ann Leung, drawing from the work of people like Daryl LaRue, who have really contributed some important sources for us to understand different definitions of what it means to think about what it means to be Canadian. And that's how I think we need to employ questions around radical reciprocity to make a difference in order to make change. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah, um, Rab Rabia. Yeah. Did you have so, your hand up? Um, yes, I want to piggyback off of um, Amy's point in like the Asian Canadian identity. I personally had experiences with that as well. I know we both went to school at different times, but growing up, um, I grew up in Markham, and I. Uh, grew up in a very East Asian populated um, area. And going to school, I was very much told that I am not an Asian, even though I am South Asian. And as Manel mentioned, there's also, you know, that sticky question of who gets to identify as being an Asian or an Asian Canadian. And I always used to go to school. I'm like, no, I'm South Asian. Um, my parents are from Pakistan and my grandparents are from India. Um, I identify as Asian and always, I'd always be told, no, that's not who you are. You can identify as a Middle Eastern or something else, but you're not Asian. But that kind of like impacted who I was as a kid and also growing up, well, what was my identity? Who could I be? Am I just, uh, do I just identify myself as a Muslim woman? But if people ask me, what's my ethnicity, what do I say then? Do I just like, do I just say that I'm brown and just make it that way? Or do I say that I'm Asian or would that offend anybody? Because technically I am not East Asian. So do I count as being an Asian? <laughs> um, and then additionally, um, when we talk about tokenism, that's also really interesting because when we look at society now, there's also um, you have employers or whoever saying that, oh, we're oh, we're so diverse. We have 50 percent people of color or we have like 50 percent women. But if you look into that, that's just 50 percent. And you're including all racial minorities in there, whether that's Asians, black people, indigenous people, whoever you're putting that in the 50 and then the rest of the 50 is still white. So how diverse is that? That's not really 50 percent. Right. It would be equal if it was, you know, you have the same number of East Asians and you have the same number of South Asians and you have the same number of white and you have the same number of indigenous, that's still very, very, very far-fetched. And it's, um, when we look into diversity hires, that's still, there's a negative connotation to that because you know that you're applying because and that you will get that job because they're looking for a diversity person to enter the role. Whether it's um, in higher education, whether it's just in, um, you know, corporate corporate office jobs or whatever it is, it's the fact that there's discrimination still present. And it's now seen as a little bit like a microaggression. And the fact that I feel like many of my co-panelists will also feel that they're desensitized to it. You know, when you enter a room and you're the only Asian person there, you're like, oh, I'm that person. I am the person of color that's supposed to be here to make that diverse voice. And I'm supposed to represent everybody. I'm supposed to represent you know, East Asians, South Asians, I'm supposed to represent Middle Easterns and <laughs> Black people, but we all have different experiences. We all come from different cultures and backgrounds and traditions. How are we supposed to encompass all of our um, values and cultures in that space? So I think that's really interesting to know and to work on also. Right. Thank you. So I, I think a number of really important issues have 
come up what is the who, who you know who counts as asian and then who counts as asian canadian and then what are the limits of thinking through asia or asian and then what are the limits of thinking about canada or you know hyphenated canadians um you know as a critic of nationalism myself it's always kind of awkward for me to think about you know what is what is an asian canadian or you know if we're doing a search uh, what who does chinese canadian studies or something like that it's always kind of strange and i kind of try to push toward the uh, transnational um but i do think that nationalism is um uh, very much tied to racism because it's it's a way of creating an externality uh to who who we are ourselves and it, it tends to be focused on the majority population of who we are when we think about that outside to the nation. So uh, I think we do need to, I mean, strategically speaking, of course, we need to go through the category, I think, of Asian Canadian or Asian, but somehow I, I feel like we need to come out the other side somewhere else and you know build those coalitions and think about what what we really are as a as a whole and and what price we pay also in categorizing ourselves in certain types of ways without regard to uh, differences and so forth. Um, the, the, um, just from, I, I don't, I'm the moderator, so I don't want to talk too much, but I, uh, from my own experience as well, I, I would say, you know, I was rather shocked actually that I took a informal survey of the uh, department heads of the Faculty of Arts and Science at uh, University of Toronto. And there was not one Asian surname person uh, and so, you know, this is rather striking to me. It, it, it is about that, um, you know, the, the ceiling that uh, Asian people often have or that, uh, as others have mentioned, that, you know, maybe one, one is enough kind of, kind of attitude. Um, but I, I, I also just want to mention, sorry to go on, but uh, with regard to the model minority discourse, um, we know that it's also debilitating because model minority discourse emerged in the 1960s in large part to contest the civil rights movement, to make it seem as though, you know, these are the good minorities and the, what, what's wrong with the black and brown people that they can't do the same kind of thing. And of course we know that this is completely wrong because there are different uh, histories. And we also know that not Asian, all Asians have made it either. Uh, so uh, I think these are really very important uh, issues to uh, discuss. Um, I, I wonder if anybody else had any more comments on this topic of modern minority tokenism, uh, heterogeneity. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, just two quick points, and thank you for for helping summarize some of those um, some of those reflections. I think that the piece about um, how you know there being uh, this model minority myth can be damaging, um, even if it's maybe potentially perceived as a positive stereotype for, for Asian folks is that it creates this um, artificial um, separation, right, between Asians um, and other racialized or minoritized groups when, in fact, we're we may be encountering some similar barriers, right? So where that maybe right. creates or spurs competition or, you know, a lack of understanding um, really, it, it doesn't really do us a service um, as Asian identified folks. Um, and I think like there's some sometimes this assumption or it's a safe, safe representation of diversity to have Asian folks, you know, on your um, around the table, on your boards, et cetera, uh, because maybe there's a view that they um, they won't rock the boat. Right. Um, or that in, in many ways, um, the you know, keeping your head down, keep going mentality, uh, which may be a sur survival technique in some circumstances, but that also is complicit with, you know, Eurocentrism and upholding white supremacy. So I think it can be very uncomfortable um, being in that position where you are the lone representative, but seen as a model representative of minorities or people of color. Um, one other quick point that I'll, I wanted to comment on from what Rabia had shared before in that example about employment and 50%, you know, diverse or non-white is that um, under, gathering the information and like knowing the numbers is important, 
Um, and it, but it's also a first step, right? Because like, what, what, what is there to know beyond the numbers? Um, but then I think there's been interesting conversations within Canadian higher education about, well, are we even collecting the numbers or, or data about diversity, whether that is faculty, students, like I know here at X University, they recently did for the first time a student um, diversity self-ID report, right? Um, and even how in those kind of demographic um, self-reporting you know, seeking um, exercises where there is a lot of gray um, or, you know, for especially folks from mixed heritage, right? Like, how do they identify? Are they counted as well, right? Um, and do they experience different kinds of challenges? So I think it's a good first step. I think that, you know, it's not something because it's complicated that we should completely abandon. And if anything, that can help us inform our understanding of the landscape in Canadian higher education mm -hmm. and employment, you know, other other kind of areas um, where we kind of regularly attend to and interpret and seek to learn and understand more from what's behind the numbers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minel? I just loved everything that you said. I think it's so spot on. I think it's really important. Um, the issue around thinking through neoliberal mechanisms that work really matters to me. There's a kind of prevalent uh, conquer and divide mentality that works to separate us in terms of thinking about how we divide ourselves as agents or how we are perceived. And we have to really prevent those kinds of uh, opportunities to split us up when we have to work together. A lot of the work that I do as a kind of equity, um, diversity, inclusion person at the university is actually done behind closed doors a lot of the time. We have committee members who are quietly chosen in advance. We meet monthly to discuss EDI priorities, but often those kinds of information is not shared among faculty writ large. So I think it's really important to open this up, to really think about the importance of transparency, to let people know that these committees exist, and often think about who gets appointed to these committees. Often these committees include the most acceptable and easygoing voice in the BIPOC communities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those people have an understanding of critical race theory, and I think that we need to think about that if we're going to include people who have an understanding of the intersectional racial formations that inform the ways in which white supremacy continues to have such a hold on our institutions. I want to get back to this point about coalitions. I think this is really key. We have to build coalitions with other faculty, not just Asian faculty, but Black, Indigenous faculty as well. One of the best things I ever did in creating my position was creating up an advisory board for my role made up of black indigenous faculty as Asian faculty but also staff and students we can't forget the important role that staff and students play what that did is it allowed for a different purview of the experiences of BIPOC faculty but also talking about connections and the things that happen when you have these meetings are really important did you know about this new student initiative that had an impact on BIPOC faculty no oh well let me tell you here's a new mentoring program for Asian faculty you might be interested interested in that as an Indigenous faculty member to see if similar kinds of projects can be developed. So this is all about transparency. We could speak about things like budgeting, finding out who got resources and why, thinking about the importance of creating trust and vulnerability. And I want to pay a bit of homage to my mentor, Shirley Nakata, who is the ombudsperson at UBC. She has taught me time and time again the most important tool that we have in our EDI toolbox is a focus on relationships. And what this advisory board did, it's allowed for different conversations in terms of thinking through relationships between Asian faculty and Black and Indigenous faculty. We also see this happening at this event today when you've got Dean Pamela Sugaman working with the director of the Yellow Hood Institute, Dr. Hayden King and Dr. Melanie Knight. So working within our groups, thinking about these constellations of care really work to strengthen and offer opportunities for true systemic change. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, Amy? I want to echo what Minel said in terms of the importance of relationship building, because to be truly inclusive and equitable, the, 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 it is incumbent on the institutions to have that relationship with the broader communities, particularly those that are most impacted by systemic discrimination, oppression, and racism. And so the I would pledge to you know the, that uh, and, and urge the um, higher education. Like I would pledge as a community member, but also from the higher education, I would urge all institutions to really look at the power dynamics between institutions and communities. And because all we are saying is to is to combat white supremacy, 
is to combat imperialism, is to combat that disparities in power, in resources, in decision making, not just in, in Canada, but across the, in, in around the world. And so it is important in, for the institutions to really look at that power dynamics and that transparency and accountability and the openness to build that relationship with organizations that will challenge the institutions, with communities that will challenge the institutions. And in that building, it's that understanding of, so what do we mean by a truly open and, and transparent, as well as, as actually equitable power relationship? So, you know, that the, if, if there are resources that, that needs to be acquired, you know, how, is, how are the institutions making these resources available and share the resources and not to acquire the resources at the expense of the BIPOC communities that are doing the hard work on the ground, on the communities for that change. So I think it is important for, for the decision makers and all of us to think about what do we mean by power sharing? What do we mean by giving us and be in that uncomfortable place of having our decisions and everything that we do being challenged? And I think that is how, how I would test, <laughs> engage the advance of, of an organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are great uh, responses. And I, I've been thinking about the issue of data collection uh, myself. Um, both as a tool and, as Dan was saying, as a limit, uh, because mm -hmm. data are, all, are always sort of um, pulled together in ways that are political. Uh, but, you know, anti-racist uh, activists can use those uh, data in important kinds of ways. I was kind of shocked when I came to the University of Toronto how, how um, uh, not, not fine-tuned the data uh, were so that uh, it was not possible to really figure out like department by department. This is something that I think Amy talked about, but department by department, which, which departments are really diverse and which, which are not. Which, what kind of incentives should we give or disincentives should we give to these places? Um, when I was on many diversity um, uh, committees in the UC system, we had very, very, very detailed um, data uh, concerning faculty representation, higher administration, students, graduate students, and so forth. Uh, and it was good, but it was also limited because uh, there was a lot of pushback uh, as well. Um, but at any rate, I think these are really important issues. And then the, the issue of um, transparency in what the university is doing, both within the university and, as Amy is saying, uh, outside the university, particularly as a public university, um, as public universities, we, we, we do have a duty uh, to be responsible to the community to, and to let them know what we are doing to further um, these um, kinds of efforts uh, against racism and other kinds of social injustices that we uh, experience. Um, I, I just want to also add that um, this idea that uh, Manel mentioned about the, and several others, of course, about the building the solidarities across BIPOC uh, people is uh, is so important, and the way that I see in general the university is working is that um, they're not coalitional, right? It, it's it's like if there's an anti-Asian problem, then there's a there's an outcry about anti-Asian racism. If there's you know black uh, um, social injustice or crime violence against black people, then it, it's talk about black people, and then if it's about indigenous people, it's talk about. But but you know to me it seems, and I think you would agree that. In a way, we're all in the same boat uh, of racism, but we don't occupy the same place in that boat. So, you know, how do we build that boat that's going to lift us all up? It seems to be a, a really big uh, um, um, topic or in, uh, project uh, for us, and not just today, but, you know, on, on, ongoing. Um, so I, I think maybe I want to uh, turn to another uh, issue that we haven't dealt with yet. And I, I think Dan in particular wanted to talk about the intersectionality of um, gender and sexuality with issues of race and anti-Asianism. And I, I invite others to talk about that uh, as well, but uh, maybe I could ask Dan first to talk about that. 
Sure, absolutely. So I think like we have mentioned, you know, like the, um, you know, there isn't a monolith for the Asian or Asian Canadian experience. And I, I believe within the national, like within the forum over, you know, today and tomorrow, there's also very specific concurrent sessions that look at some of um, these intersections, right? So whether that's like sexuality and gender um, and, and uh, other areas in terms of like opportunity or experience, um, I think like where something that I've noticed, like from working in higher education um, over the past while is, uh, you know, there there is an increasing push to internationalize or diversify our student body, right? Um, and there is right. also a lot of suspicion around like those efforts or the intentions um, behind those recruitment efforts, you know, right, to attract more international students. Um, and then thinking about seeing those in strategic plans, but then potentially, you know, questioning, well, what is what existing support and infrastructure is there in place for those students once they arrive? Like, is the goal just to get them in the door, to count them, right? Or do we actually want them to succeed, right? And are redefining how they how they are to succeed or, you know, what are their intentions or their, or their wishes coming to our institutions? Um, there was a, a really interesting and, um, you know, um, arresting um, kind of article that was in the Global Mail recently about sort of the the pipeline, I think, especially from, you know, uh, of bringing students from rural India into Canadian college systems mm -hmm. um, and sort of just the disastrous like housing and support, you know, um, uh, reality, um, you know, within Peel region, within greater Toronto area, especially. Um, and like that, you know, um, as an example of, okay, like let's widen the door, let's get them here. But then what, what do we have to offer them when they arrive? And can they actually truly succeed when there's all these competing pressures and limits, right, on what they can do? Mm -hmm. So I really mm -hmm. like would um, call to you and like, and, um, you know, faculty, staff to really think about this too, like in terms of like the directions um, and and sort of the the plans for growth that our, that our institutions have, uh, but then also, mm -hmm. you know, what, uh, what skill resource do do we have personally, right, and um, and are aware of within the greater within the greater institution and our communities, right, for these students, um, and if you know, uh, and not just talking about um, you know when when they arrive, they're already here, right, and how are mm -hmm. we serving or underserving them, I and mean, what more do we need to do to ensure that this isn't you know an exploitive relationship, right? That education is really about helping them develop um, and kind of pursue, you know, what what they can do and like what they would like to do. Um, so, so yeah, so thanks for giving me that space. Oh, no, thank you for that observation. Because I, I do think, you know, in my own experiences as well, that uh, um, internationalization of the university sounds like a good thing, um, but, you know, these students come in are, and many are not receiving the services that you, you uh, say they don't. And, and I, I very much agree with that. And I, I think, you know, this is, a, again, a way to talk about the limits of Asian Canadian, that, you know, how we should treat some, uh, some people as, you know, our own people, and then others as outside, uh, including, you know, people who might be refugees or people who might be undocumented uh, people and so forth. And I, I wonder also, a Amy, I, I know that you work with a lot of immigrant issues and if you had any thought on that and uh, about sort of, you know, the cross-border uh, tr or transnational kind of coalitions and work that we can do in higher education. We're outside in, in uh, the general sure. community. Yeah. Actually, I want to put this whole topic in the issue of funding <laughs> for okay. higher education. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, this is, I guess, a white elephant that, you know, because higher education definitely needs funding and lots of resources um, from, of course, from the student's perspective, you know, that accessible, affordable higher education is critical, particularly for marginalized and communities that are, you know, uh, unfortunately least uh, able to afford this uh, higher education. So I think we need to, we, I understand the challenge and I understand the importance of gathering resources, but then that's why in this context of, you know, universities going out there, 
you know, having international students is a major source of the funding. And so if, if you were to do that, then of course you also have the corresponding responsibility ensuring that your customers, your students here, receive the best services, receive the best support. And, and in fact, I, you know, I have heard of cases where students, of course, feel abandoned, you know, totally lost in the system, not getting the support, particularly the LGBTQ2S communities. Students, actually, many of them come from countries where actually they may be oppressed. They are not, they haven't come out. They came out here and then they they felt that they are not getting the support. And in fact, sometimes, unfortunately, they contracted, um, uh, you know, illnesses and diseases. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go for support, feel abandoned, cannot turn to their parents and their, you know, home country for help. So all these issues need to be confronted and addressed up front. At the same time, because the universities are doing this, you know, globalization, working in partnership and collaboration with you, you, with um, lots of countries around the world, particularly source countries where the, the new source of funding is from, right? And I think it is important for us to recognize that anti-Asian racism can be used as a tool for some countries, particularly those regimes that are oppressive, as an excuse or as a reason to challenge actions against oppressed uh, authorities authoritarian uh, regime and oppressions, uh, oppressive regimes. And so we can, that universities have to ha engage in all these activities, collaborations, partnerships, as well as having all these open, you know, door policy to understand the potential impact uh, on its own values and on its own principles of human rights, of, you know, anti-oppression, anti-racism, and not be used or taken advantage of in, what, in whatever shape or form just for the sake of getting funding, just for the mm -hmm. sake of getting resources. That kind of, you know, of, of um, influence and that kind of a power dynamics actually is not healthy and we need to be very mindful. And to me, I think that's why we need to have university collaborate with advocates, collaborate with groups that are fighting for racial justice, social justice, so that all these can be discussed and explored in an open, in a transparent manner, so that Canadians are, are well informed and well aware of all these pressures and all these influences, and the government is also well aware. So, and, and we should collectively advocate for a truly affordable, accessible higher education system, so that funding is not going to be the deciding factor for our institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, did anyone else want to address uh, any of these issues? Um, I, I, yes, yes, uh, Rabia. Thank you. Um, uh, what I when when addressing like this uh, the issue of intersectionality, what I usually found, and same with uh, my peers who finished undergrad or are now in doing their masters, is that the intersectional identity when we enter spaces is not looked at equally. Like we're not regarded. Like I have three different identities. I am a first generation Canadian. I am an Asian Canadian, and I am also a woman. And also, I'm a, uh, also I am a Muslim woman. So four identities. But whenever I go into a certain space, I always feel the need that I need to sacrifice a few for one. One ends up taking up the master status or to say, um, when I walk into a situation, I'm just the woman here. I am nothing else but just a woman. If I go into a different space, I am the woman of color that is here. Or if I go into a different space, I am the Muslim woman that is present there. It's never really, the intersectionality of my identities never really play equally. They always have to take turn going, which one's going to be at the forefront of this current situation, which I think is something that needs to be worked on, even when it comes to, I guess, when I was applying for scholarships um, during my undergrad, there were many from the two years that I did apply the first year, there were very um, small and selected uh, scholarships I w that I was eligible for because I didn't 
fit into the criteria that they were asking for. Whereas in the second year, there were more and they were more niche. But again, it was focused on one of your identities only. They only want to know about one thing. So it's either because just talk about your Asian experience that's here. So I don't really have anything to say or I can't really say anything about me being a woman or me being a Muslim. But it's just the fact that talk about you being an Asian in this space so we can give you the funding for school. But I feel like that's something that universities and also ex-university could work on as well, is just making it more inclusive for um, people that for people of color and also international students. Like when they come in, they're also bringing in a separate identity of being an international student. So that's one of something that intersects with their own thing. So bring that in and have it be equal so that they can present their intersectional identity as one in that sense instead of being let me pick who i am today that's yeah. one thing that support should be available for i think for higher education mm -hmm. as well but yeah okay thank you yeah i think that's a really important uh, perspective that we should all uh, keep in mind um, one of the things that i did want to say about funding uh, which is very uh, important of obviously for the university is that um, you know, we're seeing increasing privatization of the university and that we need to really depend upon uh, more public uh, funding for it so that we can be freer and have no strings attached. I think the most uh, egregious recent example of that is, as pr probably all of you know, the, um, the case of the law school at the University of Toronto, uh, which uh, turned, turned, down, turned back uh, the potential hire of uh, Professor Azarova uh, because of her stand on Palestine. And uh, this is obviously um, community pressure. And we, we see that kind of uh, community pressure, but also, I would say, governmental pressure. You know, governments, if they give money, or wealthy donors, if they give money. Uh, they, we, we, we welcome it to some extent. Uh, I have a chair which is funded by a donor, but, um, but we need to say that we're going to do what we do, you know, that we're not going to be bound by whoever is the donor and what they... They want us to do with it, except for, you know, obviously general rubrics of what we should be doing. Um, so all of these are really uh, important. And I, and I want to be sure that we get to um, talking more directly about um, what, what strategies have worked in increasing diversity in higher education and what and, and, and what's have not and, and what more. Uh, should we do? How do we overcome the systemic institutional uh, racism? And we've talked about some of those things, um, data, but there there could be other, other sorts of incentives or disincentives uh, in hiring practices, in uh, in admissions into the university, and and so forth. So, I wonder if any of you have. I'd like to hear from all of you, actually, but maybe we'll go with Manel first. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Tech. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I didn't really understand when I started this role as senior advisor, but now I see really clearly is that you have to work from top down as well as bottom up. And I suppose that's, you know, we hear that a lot, but I want to be more clear what I mean by that. Initiatives have to come from the very top of the institution, from the president and from the provost, of course, but we also need to work at a variety of scales. And for me, one thing I think we need to think about is often there's an issue around the pipeline gap or a stoppage point. Mm -hmm at the administrative level of the department, which for me means heads of department and chairs of department. They have a real responsibility to lead in powerful ways to support the creation of more equitable departments. And you know, some chairs, they make this a professional passion. They're really committed to this change, but other chairs really refuse the opportunity. And right. Tuck, I'm sure you've seen this across the board in a lot of the research that you talked about too, doing these informal conversations with chairs and heads. But when you witness this kind of inequity across departments as I have in my role as senior advisor, it creates such differences of experiences for racialized faculty. So let's just say, a chair of sociology refuses to recognize the racism that an Asian faculty member experiences with a kind of just buck it up, you know, it'll be okay, I'm sure it was an isolated incident, versus the kind of a mentality of a head saying, look, this is an issue, you need to report this to a director of human rights stat. We have a significant difference of experience. So we can't just allow individual heads to make some of the kind of informal decisions around climate. It has to be from the top down. Bottom up, what we need to do is mobilize and gather to have the conversations that for far too long have been happening behind closed doors. Too many of my discussions have been on WhatsApp and non-university emails for fear of being... Oops. 
to look at that freedom. Faculties do live in fear of sharing stories and their experiences. I don't think we talk enough about her years have been quite astounding to me. I found that gatherings in terms of thinking about solutions or strategies, bringing together BIPOC faculty is all strengthening for so many BIPOC faculty. A few of my projects recently that have been, I think, very helpful for points of connections have been wine and cheese meetings for racialized faculty. I also worked to develop a Provost Distinguished Lecture Series on race and leadership, where I brought in different people from other universities to have conversation with heads of departments. And then there was a book club that I created called Ignite, where racialized faculty met with racialized memoirists. People like Eternity Martis were interviewed by Daniel Heath Justice. Desmond Cole was interviewed by the Indigenous scholar Candace Callison. So these are all ways of opening up a conversation and amplifying the issues, but all this has to be buttressed by commitments through resource allocation in the president's and the provost office, postdoctoral fellowships for BIPOC scholars, shifts in the primitive understandings of what BIPOC go through when they go up for tenure and promotion, more hiring of BIPOC in leadership positions at the university. Last that I checked, we now have two deans of color at UBC out of 12. And, you know, it's a step in the right direction in the fact that we just hired a, a dean of color at the law school, but so much change needs to be made and it has to happen with the top-down commitment beyond lip service. It has to be through resource allocation. Right, thank you. Yeah, I think the, you know, the resource question is so important, whether it's the community uh, issue that Amy has talked about or staff issues, student issues and faculty, as you're saying, and administ administrative uh, ranks and also I was struck by your point of, about the the way that the informality of the resolving some of these questions of racism which we see too too often uh, I, just as a personal anecdote it was not Canada but it was in at UC San Diego actually I will say that I once uh, called out um, one of my colleagues on racism at a department meeting this was kind of unheard of and the department chair told me and him called me to the office and said, um, we, we, would, we would like you two to go to a counselor together. I said, counselor? I'm not, I'm not married to this guy, you know? He's like, what, what are you talking about? But anyway, that's the way that, you know, this sort of personal thing is substituted for the institutionalized systemic way in which uh, racism takes place. But uh, and, uh, any of the others also want to address the issue of what, what has worked, what has not worked, and so forth? Yeah, Amy. Actually, I want to share my experience actually with curriculum, <laughs> which is yeah. a big part, of course, with higher yeah. education. Um, mm -hmm. I actually had the privilege to teach one course uh, for international social work uh, social work students. From um, it's a sort of bridging program for internationally educated social workers, and uh, at X University. And I have to say, X University, through my years in practice in the front line, I had a privilege to also have student placement from different universities, from my own alma mater, U of T, to X University. The uh, social work faculty under actually uh, Akua Benjamin, Professor Akua Benjamin, actually what they did was, uh, Akua, first of all, coined the term anti-Black racism. And what they did was actually they established the anti-Black, uh, anti-racism and anti-oppression curriculum framework to mm. guide the work of the whole social work department. So every faculty member, every uh, student, regardless of, you know, what your interest may be, you, you are taught this framework and it guides the whole the whole every course in the faculty. So me, as a even a, a sort of like a sessional one course lecturer, I, ha I learned that and I had to unlearn I have what I learned in this faculty of social work decades ago and used that framework. I found that framework tremendously helpful as well as tremendously impactful. Um, and you can see the difference in the students that came out of that training versus students who did not. And that, mm. you know, the intersectionality lens of oppression and of course, how that framework impacts on the practice of social work, which is, you know, critical, critical. So I think the curriculum development, and as Minel said, has to be from top, you know, top down because you need the resources, you need the commitment, you need the leadership to do that kind of work and to implement that kind of systemic strategy. So the, mm -hmm. I know that we were having one of the questions on curriculum development. I think it is important 
to have that kind of integrated approach, you know, anti-oppression, anti-racism approach to all curriculum, to all the teaching at, right. at, uh, in our higher education. Yeah, I think, you know, those are great uh, suggestions. And uh, I want to give uh, Rabia, I think you had your hand up. So could you yeah. respond to this? Um, so I also want to touch on curriculum, but uh, I speak from my experience as a history undergrad at X University. And when I was on several committees, including um, the program council, and an issue that always raised that we always raised was the fact that there's so many courses that are being taught about Western history, whether that's World War One or like the sub niches of World War One, or just about like history that focuses on European history or American history or even Canadian history. But we only have one or two courses that focus on Asian history or Middle Eastern history or anything like that. So I think that is something that needs to be worked on, that more courses should be offered that touch on diverse backgrounds and diverse histories in that sense. But also part of that is a problem. The other part is having students engage in those topics and be interested in those topics. That was also something that we realized in our um, in our discussions is that even the courses that are currently being offered that focus on either South Asian history or um, like the Mughal Empire or whatever it was, there were so little students that wanted to register for those courses. And I believe that stems also from the curriculum, but more so focused back on the K-12 to curriculum. When I grew up in Ontario, our K-12 to curriculum never focused on any histories besides Canadian history or anything that was very Eurocentric. Even in high school, when I got there, there was Canadian history and then an elective course that was offered on learning about American history, but nothing that focused on world histories. I know in the Catholic school board, they, um, students are required to take a course that focuses on world religions. Maybe that could also be implemented into the K-12 curriculum that students have to take a course that relates to world histories or just, you know, issues that um, diverse backgrounds have faced and what they're um, going through now and such and so forth so that students can get interested at a younger age. And then when they come into the higher education, they are more engaged and want to learn topics about um, these people and about our own histories, about our own identities. I know for myself, it wasn't until my fourth year that I was like, you know, let me take a course that talks about my heritage and about my ethnicity and about um, my history because I don't know so much about it either. And there's not much that I can find on an inter like on the internet or on Google search. And when I did take it, I was so confused because it wasn't an intro level course. It was a course that came into it where you're supposed to know it already, where you're supposed to have a foundational information about um, uh India's history or Pakistan's history and I came into it going I know none of this so I'm a little lost and I found myself going into office hours so many times to my professor going I don't understand what's going on please explain it to me but had I had that foundational education in high school or even in elementary school whether it had been touched on for a unit or a week that would have really built my foundation to going into undergrad and possibly wanting to take more courses that either focused on my own um, history or about other people's as well rather than just, you know, Western history, because that is so important to Canadian history. But we are also very diverse. So we mm -hmm. have to focus on others as well, right? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dan? Yeah, um, I, I want to, um, all wonderful, I, I want to return to um, framework that um, Manel kind of mentioned in, in, in your response about, you know, top down and grassroots approaches. And I think that that's so important. I think like, Unfortunately, and maybe because either in terms of the, the news that we have access to or our awareness of world events, you know, it, unfortunately, there maybe seems to be a trend that like when something devastating happens, right, then we expect a response from the institution or from, you know, from our leaders, and then maybe a task force is struck, right? Um, and that mm -hmm. seems like a natural progression. Um, but I think also with the wear of maybe, and it could just be the past year and a half, especially, but, you know, the wear of that um, is sort of seeing, maybe feeling like, like an empty practice, right? So unless there's actually a commitment from uh, from leadership to, okay, like, let's, let's gather or um, bring folks together, but then actually that we will listen or that we will action on those recommendations, right? And not just sit on a report that is submitted and, and never read <laughs> or like revisit in five years right. and be like, well, what did we not do? Um, you know, I think uh, people, I think are, with regards to uh, inequality or, you know, um, racism, um, I think like folks are frustrated when, 
when it's when we're giving lip service, but then not seeing action. And action doesn't necessarily happen overnight. Um, I think a lot of action does happen grassroots as well. Um, and even people finding like their um, their community or building solidarity, wanting to help build each other up through mentorship opportunities. But I think as well, we have to recognize for those who are involved in the work that that is often voluntary and not recognized or valued right. Right, by the institution um, or reflected in hiring, promotion, um, you know, merit. So even when racialized um, or BIPOC, you know, faculty um, are under review for tenure or promotion, like some of this community work or when they're requested to be sitting on hiring committees or on diversity committees, that oftentimes can take away or why people might resist um, involvement or being kind of shoehorned into those roles is that that takes them away from their research, right? Or what they know or understand will be actually perceived as valued, right? When they're reviewed for their performance. So it, it puts folks, right, who um, are othered in this in a in a difficult position, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even if there is a will a, a willingness to help and support the broader community um, through mentorship, through, you know, connection and those kinds of things. Um, and also, I guess, this the emotional labor and, and the energy tax that that, that that requires to be involved. So right. um, I don't have an answer for that at the moment, but I think that that's something, um, you know, I, I see efforts and, you know, in multiple sites of, of those kinds of organizing pieces and supports being available. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're tired, we're, you know, people are exhausted, um, let yeah. alone the pandemic that's happening, right? So if there's ways that that can be valued or recognized um, or even supported in whatever way um, and and to to be to become actually the work and not just a, that's great accessory, nice to have, um, and mm-hmm. that's your own business, like, you know, support your people, like this is important mm-hmm. for the work of the whole institution. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for those uh, comments. I, I mean, I, I do think, as you mentioned, that um, you know, you have a case like uh, a situation of anti-Asian racism, and then you know, practically every department, but not all, by the way, put out a statement uh, against anti-Asian racism, and then it and then it kind of passes, and then it goes away, and then we're back to normal. And the university has a really an amazing way to absorb issues and then not deal with them. And one of the ways is to mm-hmm. form committees and so forth. And I think what you're pointing out is that the, the necessity of giving rewards to people who are doing this kind of work, right? Because there are too many BIPOC faculty, students, and so forth who just wear themselves out on these issues without much support from the university. I do want to um, uh, say that we got a, a few questions and from the audience. and. Uh, some of them, you know, we've, we've really are already uh, talked about um, um, how the structure of the university, for example, causes the racism um, that students and faculty experience. Um, how do we include uh, data and, and uh, other um, uh, uh, knowledge about the public university that can be used to contest racism? Uh, but there's one other issue which, um, you know, inevitably occurs when uh, people say, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a couple of questions that came out. Um, the university should be based on merit alone, and there shouldn't be something like affirmative action. So um, I wonder if any of you have an opinion about that. This is not exactly the way that the question is, is, is given, but I think it reflects a certain sentiment. Uh, we know that um, you know this, this, is, this happens. And again, back to the McLean, you know, are we coming to Asian kind of thing? Um, but I, I wonder if you have any, any of you have any thoughts on affirmative action and its, uh, and the positivities of that, the positive aspects of, about that in overcoming racism. <laughs> I'm a supporter of employment equity, and I uh-huh. truly believe that higher education is no different and should implement and work towards employment equity. It is not a, a, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's different from the affirmative action in the States. And it is truly in line with the principle of of equity, anti-racism, anti-oppression. And really looking in, you know, sort of like very detailed in terms of how your, your biases 
have been influencing and and really impacting on how you hire, and and that will lead you to questioning in terms of how do we define merit. To me, merit mm. is a subjective and racially laden and intersectional way of looking <laughs> at of merit. There is no such thing as a pure objective merit system. Given that, then we need to ensure that all that, you know, all the factors that contribute to a biased hiring needs to be addressed. And to me, that is employment equity, and that is something that all institutions should implement. Well, you know, that's a great way to end the session, actually, because we're all out of time. And uh, I wish there had been more time to address more of the issues. I actually wanted to talk a bit more about Eurocentrism in the curriculum, but maybe we can save that for uh, another uh, time. And I'll just say that I, I think Eurocentrism is not about centering a geographical place, but about whiteness. And that, that that's mm -hmm. one place that we need to really interrogate and intervene in. But having said that, I just want to thank you all for your really great uh, comments, responses, uh, thoughts on uh, the racism that exists in higher education and some of the things that we might do to overcome uh, not just anti-Asian racism, but racism against indigenous peoples, black peoples, and other people of color. So thank you very much. And thank you to the audience for um, uh, joining us uh, today. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.